Hey there, everyone, and welcome to Cure Club. Apologies for the delay in getting this one out. Maho profile had a priority for a while there, and then I took a breather period afterward. But now I'm good and ready to talk about the series again. I am not quite caught up yet. That's why we're only going up to episode 12 for this one. But uh, yeah, that's better than nothing, I guess. So first things first, the girls finally fixed their rocket and started traveling to other planets. Hooray, yay, good for them. <laughs> In theory, this opens the series up way more to wild settings and concepts than your average Precure, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what the rest of the season has in store on that front. The two off-planet episodes we've had so far were adorable and fun, and they were both just abundant with corny puns. Or should I say... abundant? Eh? Yeah, no, sorry. I guess that was a little... boneheaded of me. In all seriousness, the only worry I have about the off-planet stuff so far is that you can feel the episode time constraints holding them back a bit. I mean, these are whole new worlds to explore. That should feel big in some way. But so far, both planets that we've visited have felt, well, small. In both stories, we meet a few of the residents, explore a tiny section of the planet, find a star pen, fight the baddies, and then leave. Any complicating differences between Earth and these new planets, such as the cultural differences on the dog planet, or the increased gravity on the gem planet, are joked about but otherwise smoothed over for plot's sake. Also, to make each world distinct within the limited time window, the world and their inhabitants are all ultra-simplified and made to fit one easy-to-understand theme. As a result, the worlds feel kind of stunted in their conception. But that said, I don't think simplified worlds are all bad either. You could argue that these concepts reflect how a child might imagine a new planet, in broad, uncomplicated, and wild strokes. Given the show's theme is imagination, this childlike conception of an alien world is actually super on point. Like, like imagine a kid coming up to you and saying, Oh, oh I think there's, there's a, a, a doggy planet! And it's made of bones, cause doggies love bones. Oh, oh, I bet it rains bones there. And and the doggy aliens are all super fluffy, and they love playing and jumping, and and they want everyone to be fluffy like them because fluffy things are good. You see what I mean? Not exactly a complex vision for a world there, but it fits the pure and innocent imagination the series aims to evoke. You only need to look at Hikaru's trip through Lisa Frank space in the first episode to understand the kind of whimsy this series is going for. So, does it bug me that the worlds don't feel bigger and more expansive? Well, yeah, but I'm also willing to roll with it considering the production practicalities and the themes of childlike imagination on display. And actually, if I can speak more generally for a bit, I do always feel some disappointment at the limitations of formulaic shows like this. Certain developments can easily get cut short or sidelined in favor of including all the elements a show's formula requires. And that happens a lot with the episodes in this batch. The threat of Lala getting deported suffers the most on this front, with the emotional impact of her looming departure being undermined by all the silly jokes and villain antics that this episode has to also include. However, I think going forward, I'm not going to complain about the limitations of the show's formula anymore, unless something gets completely ruined by it. I may be disappointed when something feels shoehorned in by formula, or when something interesting gets less breathing room because of it. However, I don't dislike the formula on principle. Slice-of-life antics, colorful transformations, and fun fights against villains are part of what keeps me coming back every week. When you get into any kind of formula show, be it Precure, Super Sentai, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, or something similar, I think you have to accept the formula to at least some degree. Formulas make episodes easier to follow for young kids, they build up a comfortable familiarity for viewers over time, and they help highlight any plot points that subvert that familiarity. Case in point, Star's Taurus Pen. In formulaic magical girl shows like Precure, Transformation or attack sequences almost always play uninterrupted. So when something does interrupt them, and it's not for a gag, you know something's going down. 
Capard winning out over Star and stealing her pen would have been a significant enough development on its own. Having him interrupt Star's stock animation to take it? That gives the scene an even stronger impact. That's pulling a rug out from underneath Than's most ingrained expectations. And playing with expectations requires that there be expectations in the first place. Strict episode structures and stock footage sequences establish those expectations and help create those bigger payoffs later. Can episode formulas and stock sequences make episodes boring, predictable, or rushed? Yeah, sadly they can. There are ways to keep things interesting while adhering to formula, but it's difficult to achieve that balance all the time. So long-running series can easily produce a lot of rushed or dull filler episodes propped up by nothing but their expected structures. However, I don't think the structures themselves are necessarily at fault, at least not in all cases. As much as they can get in the way or create awkward pacing, formulaic elements still serve an important narrative function and serve as their own familiar fun from week to week. And to be honest, after a certain point, Constantly complaining about something so core to how these series operate just makes you wonder, well, why are you even watching a formula show if you dislike formula so much? So yeah, I'm probably not going to comment on any awkwardness due to episode formulas again, unless it's for something really, really noteworthy. And to be honest, as far as formulaic storytelling goes, I think these episodes fare quite well. The Rocket Repairs episode was a great little bonding period for the girls, it highlighted Hikaru's strengths as a character, and it gave us the new Rocket, complete with Prince's all-important donuts machine. <laughs> the Dog Planet episode was our first taste of off-planet adventuring, it gave Elena a focus story, which is always a good thing, and they even slipped in a surprisingly good moral about allyship. Namely, even if you're doing something for a person or group's own good, that person or group has no reason or obligation to trust your intentions unless you demonstrate an active empathy for and understanding of their needs, as well as a willingness to turn that understanding into supportive action. You know, just saying. Madoka's focus episode is a gem with regards to fitting a good story inside a rigid episode structure. We got exactly the kind of personal conflict I was hoping to see from her, with her stress levels being driven up by the expectations of both her mundane and magical lives. I will always support the idea that downtime is a part of being a healthy person. Heck, that's the reason I took a break after the last Maho profile. Anyone who tries to be on and productive 100% of the time will inevitably buckle under the pressure in some way, even if it's just wearing mismatched socks, and usually it's way worse than that. Telling kids it's okay to give themselves breathing room and to have shoulders to lean on is super important. And at this point we've seen that message expressed through both Lala and Madoka, which makes me very happy. These sorts of episodes have been great for Hikaru as well. The show continues to build Hikaru up as someone who innately understands when people need a weight lifted off of them which is always a good trait for a pink cure to have. And you know what else is good to see with pink cures? Vulnerability. Not all pinks fit the endless fountain of Genki and positivity archetype, but so far Hikaru certainly has. So it's nice whenever we're reminded that that's not all there is to her. We saw it when she got angry with Lala in episode three, and we especially see it in episodes 10 and 11. Forcing Hikaru to face the fact that her impulsive desires may sometimes endanger people, and that she might not truly understand space at all, is great stuff to throw at her. We learn that Hikaru used to come to the planetarium for solace when she was younger a lot, and that she hasn't as much recently. There's likely some pain in Hikaru's past that we haven't explored yet, and which may be rearing its head again now. Thankfully, Hikaru has some great friends to keep her steady when the Knot Raiders try to tear down her self-image. They assure her that she was the key to bringing them all to where they are now, and that while she may not understand everything about space, her love for it is genuine. And that's enough to change the universe! Or at least activate a power-up. It's about time Team Star Twinkle got their group attack. Southern Cross Shot is not only a visually satisfying move, but the show built up to it very well through Hikaru and Mr. Ryo's talks about the Southern Cross constellation. 
Goodness knows what constellation power-up we may see after our fifth ranger joins the team. Anyone have any guesses about that, maybe? Going back to the Not Raiders for a moment, the Creator seem to have really sown the seeds of redemption at this point. Seeing the three generals tortured during their power-up from Darkness, as well as hearing Kapard lash out about his planet being taken, are clearly sympathy-garnering moves, and I am all here for it. I'm particularly curious to see what's going to happen with Bakenyan. He worries for the generals when they're in pain, hangs back from battle out of concern for unbalancing the group, and seems like he's always thinking about more than anyone gives him credit for. If anyone proves to be a catalyst for villains switching sides eventually, I wouldn't be surprised if it's Bakenyan. Also on the villain front, we see three more not riggers pop up in this batch, and two of them are in the same unimaginative tier as the Mr. Ryo monster from episode 6. Heck, the Sakurako monster may be worse, even. I was expecting her not rigger form to be based on her binoculars, which make several appearances in Episode 9. Uh, but nope, her not rigger doesn't even have an interesting form. It's just a vaguely humanoid blob with Sakurako's hair. Come on, really? Really now? Come on, Precure staff, you can do better than that. I mean, I know you can, because you did it in the episode where the generals combined to create their own not rigger While not the most badass design in the world, it at least shows a spark of IMAGINATION! <laughs> creating this memorable-looking clown beast with clear visual elements from each general. I like how the generals pilot it like a giant mecha from the chest, too, and how its quote-unquote voice changes depending on who's speaking for it. Cool stuff. Cool beans. Yes, I just said cool beans. I know that makes me a square. <laughs> Jumping back to Sakurako, by the way, I don't think I've mentioned her yet, but I'm very much enjoying her whenever she shows up. As I understand it, there's supposed to be a similar character in Mahotsukai Precure, right? I've seen maybe one random episode of that series, so I have no idea which character that is, but if they're as enjoyable as Sakurako, I am all for this archetype in Precure. I am getting big-time Nanami Kiryu vibes from Sakuroko, and considering how much I love Nanami, that's a huge compliment. Huh. Anyway, before we get to viewer comments, here are 10 more quick things I thought were notable about these episodes. Number 1. I know they probably won't go down this road, but does anyone else get HAL 9000 vibes from Lala's AI? Mildly creepy. Number 2. Hikaru launching into her pre-episode introduction spiel with the dog aliens is a great goof. I love it. Number three, I'm continuing to like the Zodiac power-ups for the girls' attacks. Madoka's goat-headed Capricorn bow is my favorite so far. That is badass. Number four, the princesses continue to be pretty and not have much substance. I won't comment on them much going forward unless they do something significant. If I don't say anything when a new princess appears, you can assume that I think they're pretty and not much else. Oh, I do like the bit where the Libra princess doesn't recognize Prince under all his fur, though. That was cute. Number five, Elena speaking in English to ask what page they're on in class is precious. Ah. Number six, the scene where Elena tells Madoka how much she admires her and how Madoka shouldn't be afraid to ask for help is extremely gay, and you can't tell me otherwise. Hashtag Sun X Moon. Number seven. I'm glad that carry mode is now a thing for the rocket, but is there a reason they didn't use it after their first alien planet visit? Number eight. Mr. Rio is now officially in on Lala's secret. That's cool, that's cool. Cool, cool, cool. Number nine. The whole thing with P.P. Abraham being a tiny alien Piloting a human bot is amazing. I love it. I love everything about this concept. This is great. Thank you, Precure. Thank you for giving me this. And number 10. Aside from the PP Abraham stuff, the movie making episode is a bit weak overall. Still, it did give Lala a family name, Hagaromo, which was very sweet. Aww. Okay then, let's wrap up with a couple of reader comments. First off, several of you pointed out that advertising the movies in the opening and ending sequences is something that happens every year, so thank you all for that. 
That's frustrating to find out because I really didn't like how long that lasted. It got to a point where we had had more episodes with the movie promo openings than with the regular opening. <sighs> At least the ending went back to normal sooner. Eh. Ember Keelty had some great insight as a long-term Precure fan. She brought up the movie promo thing and also commented on how Elena's family and store almost certainly will not create any major conflict for Elena, save for maybe one episode where a villain attacks her store and takes her sibling's hostage and it only makes her more powerful. Hmm. In hindsight, we can tell this from Elena's introduction where she explicitly says that having more people to protect just makes her stronger. That's a little concerning because I think Elena hasn't been given many other potential avenues for conflict so far. I really hope the writers don't start struggling with what to do in her focus episodes in the future. <sighs> Aurabolt had a great longer comment that I won't read in full, but I was happy to hear their appreciation for the minutia and magical world building in the series. That's one of my favorite aspects to pick apart in series like this too, so I'm glad someone else is into it. Aurabolt also asked a question. Since you're somewhat new to Precure, do you have any interest in Netflix and Saban's Glitter Force? Hmm. I watched the first episode of Glitter Force when it first hit Netflix, and while I decided it wasn't for me, the English voice acting was a bit too cornball even for my tastes, I'm still glad it exists. Do I wish it were closer to the Japanese original? Sure, I think there's no reason why they couldn't have kept the original names and just done a straightforward dub. Maybe with minor edits or episode cuts if they really felt certain content was inappropriate for North American audiences. But regardless, mainstream dubs have always been great for getting young viewers in other countries into the magical girl genre. I mean, like many of my generation, it was the old Deke dub of Sailor Moon that pulled me in at first. And I know many others came in through 4Kids dubs like Mew Mew Power and Magical Doremi. As many problems as those old dubs had, they still had a lot of heart and clearly connected with their intended audiences. And with how widely available Netflix is, I can only hope that Glitter Force and Glitter Force Doki Doki are connecting with young girls in the same way now. Hopefully at least some of those kids will find their way to Pretty Cure proper eventually. And even for those who don't, I'm glad that they'll have had these dubs as part of their childhoods, at least. And I think that'll do us for now. Thank you all again for joining me on another episode of Cure Club and being patient with my inconsistent release schedule. Like I said earlier, as much as I want to put stuff out all the time, I have to make sure I balance YouTube with my work life and relaxation time so that I don't get burned out. So that means release schedules are sometimes hard for me to stick to. I had a couple of weeks delay during the production of this video, in fact, because I just found I didn't have the energy outside of work to do video stuff for a while. Hopefully it won't take too long to produce the next installment and get caught up to where Star Twinkle is now, at least. And regardless, I hope you'll look forward to the next installment whenever it comes out. Thank you so much, and see you all then! Thanks so much again to all my patrons who support me every month, especially Anna, Author X, Julia and Kyle, Lavitz, and Otaku no Podcast. Also, just thought you should know that Rally Vincent deserved better, and that the best transformation phrase is Tekumakumayakon, Tekumakumayakon! Goki yo, motherfuckers! I wouldn't be doing this if not for the generous support of viewers like you. You can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Aaron Cerise. You can make small one-time donations at ko-fi.com slash Aaron Cerise. Or you can always share this video and leave a like or comment to show your support. Thanks so much again and have a good day! Goodbye!